It's a pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Um, it's only been in the last couple of years <clears throat> that institutionally here at Bard Graduate Center, we've begun focusing more attention on the world of research, let's say the ecology of research. We tend to think of the institution as a graduate research institute, and one of its distinguishing features is the interpenetration of research by students and faculty, teaching and formal events like this. But what we've come to consider a lot more is um, in the ecology of research, there are all kinds of researchers. Um, some of the easy ones uh, we can think of researchers who are within institutions or researchers who are outside of institutions. Um, we might think of the different, different kind of research done by professors and that done by conservators. Um, we've begun to take much more seriously the kind of research done by artists, and that's something which um, we now think about or gently don't think about, which is a similar achievement every time we stand by the elevator and look at uh, Mark Dion's Conservator's Cupboard. There's a lot of research that goes into that piece as indeed into all of Mark's work. Uh, and Mark was really amongst the first of the artists doing research whom we have brought in here. Michael Shanks and uh, Michael Pearson are, were another example of that when they were performing here last year. And I think it's really with that in mind that when we were in the fellowship um, search last year and Dr. Jeanette Lyons' um, application was there to be looked at, we were really interested. We were interested in a poet and a writer of fiction who was herself interested uh, in further exploring questions of distance. What is distance, our theme being for the year. Um, we were interested in seeing what distance would look like when it was being presented to us or represented to us by a writer and a poet. So it's really, that was the background for today. Um, Jeanette is the coordinator of the MFA in Writing and Interdisciplinary Center for Culture and Creativity at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, where she's a professor in the English department. She has an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Southern Maine and a PhD in English from York University in Toronto. Um, she's a, a very well-published poet and, uh, and novelist, and the novels tend to be a historical novels, uh, though often set in the recent past, to use Benjamin's term and not, you know, Victor Hugo set in uh, a long lost uh, age. Um, the one that I've looked at, The Factory Voice, a novel published in 2009, is really a kind of novel of the, the recent historical past. And even, I won't say uh, anything more, but turn the floor uh, over to her, <coughs> and uh, thank you very much for wanting to join us as a fellow. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Miller, and um, I'm um, very grateful to all of you for coming uh, today at this uh, very busy time in the semester, and like to welcome those of you from outside of the Graduate Center and in the city who've come, and I'd I really like to thank um, Bard Graduate Center for hosting me, and um, especially uh, Dr. Miller and, and Laura um, Minsky, and the wonderful team in the library. They've just been fabulous, and uh, I, I am here as a creative writer, and uh, uh, I'm very um, humbled to, to be here in that, uh, in that capacity, and uh, I will be giving you that um, side of me today, that, that perspective um, on uh, um, what I've called in my um, title, uh, Poetic Inquiry, which I guess is a fancy way of just talking about the creative process for a, for a writer of fiction uh, and poetry. And uh, as, I, as I understand it uh, today, um, the f what format will take if, um, is that, that I'll talk for about 30 minutes. I think that's about, about right. And I've got my watch here because I tend to rah, rah, overrun. And then I'd be really interested in, yes, note to self. And then I'd be really interested in hearing uh, questions that you might have or a conversation that you might like to, uh, like to have. So uh, uh, as Dr. Miller mentioned, I, I am going to be talking about um, distance and try to unpack a little bit what that um, means for a writer who has been writing. Um, as, as Dr. Miller also mentioned, uh, my work is not set in, um, you know, the 16th century court or uh, the, the uh, you know, um, ancient Greece or, or the, the, the kinds of novels that 
um, really famous writers write. Um, I've, I've written three novels now. My second one's coming out uh, in the spring. Um, I'm mainly going to be talking about uh, the novel that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I published. Can everybody hear me okay, or should I use my teacher voice? Is this, is this okay? <laughs> okay. I mainly will talk about the, no uh, the novel uh, based in an aviation factory in uh, northern Canada during World War II, focusing on women uh, who built uh, planes for the, the war effort. Um, and uh, a little bit about a poetry um, collection um, that is a kind of biopic of um, a real person, an English poet named John Clare, um, who some of you may have heard of, lived from uh, 1793 to 1864. A little bit about what I'm working on now, but creative writers are weird that way. We, uh, we kind of, you know, people are, what are you working on? We kind of don't, it feels a bit like maybe bad luck or we're going to jinx it or something to talk too much about what we're doing now, but um, I, I um, the novel coming out as, uh, seem to be inching forward in time, a uh, big chunk of it set in the 1950s, um, kind of really Mad Men inspired. <laughs> um, so I'm, uh, I'm a little intimidated to, to use even the term historical with his historians in the room but and what that even means. But I'll just stick to um, creative process and, and distance. Um, and the research I'm doing here is on, um, for an eighth poetry manuscript, uh, early stages, uh, uh, 19th century uh, spiritualism, and I've uh, been uh, infiltrating my way into down the street by the park, the um, uh, American Society for Psychical Research. I've been trying to infiltrate their archives. I, I, it's a work in progress. I, I've been e I'm in an email loop with them, trying to convince them I'm not a kook, but maybe maybe I am. <laughs> but I'm hoping they'll let me into the archives during my time here. So um, I will talk about material culture as it applies to creative writing. Um, I apologize that I don't have a spectacular pyrotechnic PowerPoint to show you. Um, I'm low tech. I, I'm no okay. I'm no tech. So uh, I hope it's not too dull and and um, and boring uh, for you. Um, so um, uh, using historical material um, in a creative writing projects is is wonderful fun, um, and uh, it it's uh, it also presents challenges. Um, so when I when I write a story that's set in the past, um, I'm staging an encounter with the past. I, I didn't I didn't live in this time period. Uh, I wasn't alive then. I, I have to imagine it. It has to feel alive. It has to be convincing. It has to be compelling, and it has to keep readers interested. Um, so. For a creative writer who uses historical material, uh, distance um, is actually a problem. Distance is a problem. Um, but in equal measure, it's, it's a boon. So as a creative writer, you're, constantly, you're in constant negotiation with, with distance. Um, so what I mean by this is that you're, you're, you're trying to cut down on distance. Otherwise, your story is going to feel static and remote and stodgy and, and dull, and not, it's just not going to have any life to it, right? You have to breathe the spark of life into it um, somehow. So you're trying to cut down on distance, um, but you also need to preserve it in an ex to, an ex to a certain extent, right? So you're situating your, every, every time you sit at the writing desk, you're kind of situating yourself in some kind of weird, hybrid space between distance on the one hand and immediacy on the other hand, um, or um, the interstices. I just looked up on the internet how to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> I went into the washroom on the fourth floor and, and I got on this little site and she said, interstices, interstices. It said the 10 words that are most mispronounced, so hopefully she was right, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, the creative writers work in strange kind of hybrid zones in between spaces, liminal spaces between things, interstices, now I know what I'm showing off. So you're trying to create immediacy in, in um, a creative work that, that is essentially based um, on historical source material. Um, but yet you still want that world to be distinct. So a reader wants both. I think I shouldn't make grand pronouncement on what a reader wants, but I do think a reader wants to, uh, to enter another world 
when you open a book, a novel, or a book of poetry, or short stories, you do want to enter another world. You don't want to read about yourself making toast this morning. At least I, you might, I don't think you do. But yet you also want, as my students would say, you want relatability. You, know, you want enough immediacy to, to engage with that, that world and to enter that world. So this constant interplay between distance and proximity or distance and immediacy. You want enough immediacy for the reader to be able to empathize with your characters um, and their plights. So the challenge becomes to diminish enough of a sense of distance to keep the historical world intact and preserve a feeling of historicity on the one hand, but still create a sense of closeness for the reader um, on the other hand. So that's kind of the, the double valence of the, um, of the creative process or this kind of what I'm talking um, about as mapping, you know, creativity or a mapping poetic inquiry. Um, I do still like what the Russian form formalist Viktor Shlovsky said about art, which as I'm sure you all know is that uh, what art does is it defamiliarizes, right? It displaces things out of the common, out of the ordinary into, um, into, another, into another place. Um, and I think that, that working with historical sources does involve a kind of defamiliarization up to, up to a point. So trying always to situate your story or your poems in a kind of strange space between distance and proximity. And, and this becomes a constant in um, artistic practice, at, at least, at least for, for writing. I, I, I can't speak for... Um, um, for painters or, or any other you know, discipline within the fine arts. So I'm just going to um, give you some specific examples of, um, I guess, this sort of practice, this constant negotiation between distance and proximity. I'll, I'll read um, a couple of, of snippets probably. I'll say a little bit about my um, current uh, project. Um, but just, I guess, a little bit of background first, too. As, as Dr. Miller mentioned, um, I um, trained as um, a literature scholar. Um, I sort of retooled as a creative writer uh, partway through my trajectory. And uh, I still teach literature, but I mostly teach uh, creative writing. And um, what I, I love to write more than anything uh, is, is novels. And that's a, that's a really unfortunate <laughs> because each one takes, um, this took seven years and the one I'm finishing now took eight years and I thought the second one would be easier. Uh, so it's, uh, but I, I'm obviously um, in, very in love with, um, with novel writing and, and poetry um, as well. Uh, fiction, it has been argued, can, can teach um, empathy, can teach emotional intelligence. Um, I've had um, mixed results uh, convincing um, granting agencies and, uh, and so on about the, uh, the value of um, a creative writing within, within the academy, um, but um, that's okay, you know, we, we do our work no matter what. Um, so, um, although the terms fiction and history are often set in opposition, um, they, I, I don't believe that uh, they are um, totally incompatible at all. Um, they both track a narrative from a particular perspective. Um, they're, they're, they both have a very storied aspect to them. And uh, I like what the English author David Mitchell says a lot about um, historical fiction. And why, why, is, it, why is it so popular? He, he's talking about its enduring popularity. There's huge sections in bookstores on, on historical fiction and um, there's still a great appetite for it I think and David Mitchell uses a musical analogy uh, saying quote historical fiction delivers um, a stereo narrative from one speaker comes the treble of the novel's own plot while the other speaker plays the bass of history's plot B-A-S-S -S, bass a second reason is genealogical Mitchell says if history is the family tree of now a historical novel may illuminate the contemporary world in ways that straight history, I'm not quite sure what he means by that, may not. A third reason for the genre's popularity is simply that while the needs of the human heart and body stay much the same, the societies human, humans live in vary dramatically between centuries and cultures, and to watch people live, people whom we might have been, had, been one, had one been born then, is fascinating for its own sake. 
So I, I really like Mitchell's use of the stereo narrative, uh, the bass and the bass and the treble, and, and the, the way that the story has to kind of exist on these two, these two planes. Um, so um, another uh, aspect of this, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, is it's an enormous work to finally breathe life into your story. Um, many, many earlier drafts of this were just like embarrassing, just stilted, corny, bad. Um, and there has to be a way that the reader can believe the story and relate to it on an emotional level. And I, I read some, some affect theory, and I, I like Lauren Berlant's term of an affect spear. So you're, you're trying to create that in, when you write your, your story um, as well. Um, to avoid a story feeling distant, or a distance between you and the narrator and the reader. So how do you create an affect spear? Um, you know, cutting down distance to make the story um, relatable. And the 1940s, uh, the young women working in the aviation factory in this story, they can't, uh, they can't text each other. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't know what a, a computer is. Uh, you know, there, there's enormous amounts of, of, of differences um, between then and, um, and now. Um, not to mention the, um, the, uh, the actual airplanes. Um, the, the factory uh, in the story is based on a real factory in northern Canada, and one of the characters, um, a lady engineer in the 1940s, is based on an actual um, uh, person, uh, who um, Elizabeth McGill. She was Canada's first woman aeronautical engineer. She was a quite an extraordinary woman. She was the first woman in Canada to design an airplane, and um, she was sent up into this tundra-like place to oversee the production of Hawker Hurricanes um, in this factory, and um, th they were pretty freaked out in 1940 when uh, a woman arrived, and she was she was the boss of, of of she was the engineer, she was chief engineer, and she stayed up there for several years, the real person, and oversaw production of these planes. And something also extraordinary about her was that she was in her 30s at the time, and she um, she had polio. Um, and she almost, she went to, uh, well, not, not MIT, but it was an engineering school in the Midwest of America, a very distinguished school. And she almost didn't graduate uh, because of her disability, but she, she did. So I have a great admiration for, for her. Um, and um, many choices went into the characters in the story. Um, uh, I didn't use her real name. Um, I, I kept her disability I th because I thought it was extraordinary. Um, so it's always this sort of negotiation with facts as well and what you're, what you're inventing. Um, so I'll get to poetry a little bit um, later, um, but I want to give some examples now about this sort of negotiation. And I want to uh, talk a bit about um, objects. So in a work of historical fiction like any fiction, I suppose unless it's wildly experimental, <coughs> you're basically just building scenes. You're, you're writing scenes, right? And each scene needs to, needs to be anchored in, in a, some sort of material place. Um, so m my writing's very object-driven insofar as um, I, I use objects to anchor my scenes, and I use objects to um, build uh, my characters. So. This is where the, the fun comes in. I'm a total research nerd, and I just, I just adore this part of it. Um, the, the trouble, too, with, with writing creatively, um, especially novels, is you can just, for years, get lost in the research. I could have gone through magazines on women's hairstyles and clothing. Um, where's the perfume scholar? Where are you? Christine. Oh, oh yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. So um, I would find a kind of anchoring object for each character, and uh, for one character, it's um, it's perfume. It's Dorothy Gray white lilac cologne. And in the at the time in women's magazines, that was the thing. Every era seemed to have its. There's this when, when I, I guess when I was like a teenager, I was like, is this? weird perfume that came in a little bottle shaped like an apple or, or, or Charlie or something. So, so that brand of perfume becomes a kind of signature object for that character. It doesn't appear every time the character appears because that would be a bit 
much, but um, th this is where objects uh, come into it. And Dorothy Gray White Lilac Cologne, probably no one in this room has ever smelled it, but we, so there's a kind of way that it's exotic, but we also know what perfume is. So it's, it's both distant <laughs> and proximate. Um, so, um, there are a lot of things to consider. I mean, what, what, did, what did people wear? What, what did they eat? How did wartime rations uh, affect what they ate? Were boots called boots or were boots <coughs> called galoshes or, or something else? What kind of music did they listen to? And this, of course, was great fun to research as well. Did they listen to it on a Philco radio? Um, you know, it's all objects, right? Um, what would um, someone call, a, what would a young man in the, in the factory in the 1940s call um, a woman on the shop floor he found exceptionally attractive? I, I have no idea. A babe, maybe. I don't know. So, you know, we're writers. We, we make stuff <laughs> up, right? <laughs> we make stuff up. So I just I invented, you know, she's a slice of heaven. I mean, it's not that brilliant or anything. But um, I, because I don't actually know, I, I can, that opens a space that I can just, I can just invent, be inventive. Um, in one scene, the characters go bowling. They don't just work. They work a lot, but they're, they're, they had a lot of baseball leagues, and you know, they work huge long hours. But in one scene, they go bowling, and one character's uh, showing off in a bowling alley in the 1940s. Um, I, don't think, I don't know if people know what, a pin, what pin boys were. You might um, we don't have them now, but they actually had human people would, when you bowled, somebody would be down at the other end Sounds a bit dangerous to me. And they would set the pins back up, so they were pin boys, and that was kind of neat. But one character's showing off, and the other guy says, ah, he's a regular Andy Verapapa. Well, m maybe we don't know who that is, but from the context, we can see that he's probably some hotshot bowler, right? And he was. He was, uh, uh, he was a trick bowler from, from Brooklyn, um, famous for his, um, his boomerang shot. Who knows? Like sounds like he would roll and then would come back. How do you do that? I don't know. So I also use people, not just objects, to, to situate that story in the zone between distance and proximity. But, but I do use objects. Um, I do use objects more. And um, um, I, I love catalogs. I love lists of things, you know, like in, in the great epics, there'd be great long lists of, of the warrior's shields and things like that. And I love all that. I love it, love it. I love lists and catalogs. So um, these are all objects that I use um, a lot in my, in my writing. And um, you, you get some pushback on that from editors. And because they're not, if you have a great long catalog of objects, is not plot driven, right? It can bog the story down a lot. Then a great long catalog of airplane parts, which I was made to condense <coughs> into about half the length. I wanted it to go on for pages and pages to sort of reinforce the sense of just the, the, the massiveness of this endeavor. Like, it's incredible. But I did have to um, compromise. Um, and I, 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 do, I do think that objects have a kind of poetics. Um, I'm, I'm a poet, right? So I'm not a very plot-driven fiction writer. In fact, plot's really hard for me. It's really, really hard. It's murder. <laughs> um, but I do love working with catalogs and images and objects. And uh, I like this quote a lot from um, uh, a book that I read recently um, by um, someone named Peter N. Miller. And he speaks about the, the longing trapped in things. And um, I thought about that a lot. And objects do, I think, have a kind, their own kind of poetics. They want to be in the story. Um, another object besides cologne was um, in the 1940s, they were selling all kinds of odd concoctions to people. There was something, uh, and the, the target market was women. There was something called um, Dr. Chase's Nerve Powder. And I found that in magazines. And I, I thought, it was, what is that like? cocaine or what? So, so I, I it's, who knows, right? But so I have the, the chief engineer, a very stressful job. So I, I have to make her a person as well as a scientist. I don't know anything about engineering, nothing. I went to the archives. I, I went all through her papers. What would she be trying to figure out on a, a typical day in 1941? She was actually trying to figure out how to put uh, landing skis on the, uh, on, on the planes. Uh, it was very interesting, and I could see her little doodles, and it was quite a 
poignant moment for me to actually see all her elaborate mathematical, because I also can't do math, but I also had to make her a person, so she would get stressed out and have a little bit of um, Dr. Chase's nerve powder. <laughs> it's not like a fainting sofa thing or anything. She, I mean, she's a spunky heroine in my story. <laughs> Um, so there's lots and lots and lots of um, examples that I could give you. Um, uh, popular culture of the time uh, provided a lot of um, figurative language for me, metaphors and similes. Uh, one girl is running faster than Jean Krupa's drumsticks. And even if you don't remember who Jean Krupa was, the famous big band drummer, you would probably, you would get, you would know she was running really fast. Another girl has hair, beautiful hair that flowed like Veronica Lakes, right? So readers can get things from context, um, which I, the hope is creates a kind of intimacy, even though the, what the trope has a kind of artifact quality to it. Um, so um, I'm going to um, uh, move a little bit more on to uh, the poetry now, because I, I, if, if, if with your indulgence, I would read just a couple of little brief snippets. I have till quarter two, I think. Um, I have lots more, but that's, that's a good problem. Um, food is a lot of fun. If you're uh, thinking of doing some uh, creative uh, writing um, set in the past, uh, in one scene, um, a young man and a young woman are in a diner, and uh, there's a, a miss, what underpins the scene is a miscommunication. Uh, she thinks it's, uh, she's an aspiring journalist. She's going to be like Lois Lane, right? And she's going to get this guy's story. He thinks they're on a date. so the scene goes sideways because there's a basic miscommunication underlying it. So they're in a diner and they order um, hot pork sandwiches and, um, uh, uh, oh yeah, right, soft drinks. They're called soft drinks in the US and they're not called pop or they're called sodas. Anyway, I spent a lot of time <laughs> researching the history of sodas and it's super interesting. It's super, in and the artwork, the graphics that, that they, they had to sell these drinks were extraordinarily actually beautiful. One had, um, the logo was a, a fairy, and it sounds silly, but it was, it was a, it's a beautiful piece of visual design. So, you know, months go by, and what, you're still researching the, what they drank at this lunch. You've got to get on with it. That's what I mean about <laughs> you can get so, so uh, um, sidelined with just the research because it's so much fun. Anyway, they order lemon phosphates with their hot pork sandwiches. And these were, these were real drinks. And they were, when I found it, it's kind of like, yay, because it's the perfect drink for them to have at that lunch, right? It's sort of tart and, I don't know, it just sounds kind of edgy and tart. So objects help you realize your story. I didn't sit down and I'm going to look for the perfect kind of soda these two will have at their querulous lunch. Just what would, what could they drink? What could they drink? And and with the internet, of course, we immediately have at our fingertips so much information, and and you just you just hit on things. So much of artistic practice is accident, and fluke, and just casting about and floundering about. So when I found lemon phosphates, that that was a <laughs> happy place, right? Uh, that made my day. So um, it, it, it's so much of of it really is just fluke and floundering. Um, and, and not setting out, because you, you don't know, right? So I'll speak briefly, briefly about this poetry manuscript. I know I'm, I'm going quite quickly, but I want, I want time for questions. And I might read a poem and a couple of paragraphs in the remaining couple of minutes. Um, this was a lot more difficult, um, you know, slender little volume, but still took, took about, well, uh, six years in between, in summers, right, between teaching. Um, and um, to, <laughs> to try to, I mean, this was very distant to me, John Clare's world. I mean, early 19th century rural England, time of the enclosures, uh, some different nationality for me, different gender for me. Um, pff, the only <laughs> remote connection I might have had with John Clare is that um, I'm also from, um, kind of a hard scrabble agricultural background and Claire lived uh, in quite in his family in quite um, well yeah relative relative poverty um, he thought he was going to live on his poetry <laughs> we still think that right and we, <laughs> <laughs> we have to keep our day jobs um, so again um, 
objects were very distant in this, in this collection, doing the research. Uh, the first poem contains a calder riddle, and that was part of a threshing machine that was used in uh, the early 19th century. And I didn't know what it was, I researched it. Within the context of the poem, a reader can tell what it is. So hopefully there's a way to connect with the reader. So a lot of it is, is contextual, right? Um, there weren't, weren't that many references to um, clothing. I read Claire's autobiographical work. Um, but the anchoring image in the whole book probably is, uh, for John Claire, is uh, an odd word. Uh, um, he would walk out in nature for endless hours and he would have a stick with him, <coughs> just from a tree, and he would poke at things. So he did. He, he would, uh, um, one brilliant uh, scholar calls what he was writing about uh, his poems in e ecology of foregrounds because he would get right up to a fungus or a bird's nest or um, he, but he would poke at them with his progling stick that's what he called it or he would prog he would talk about uh, going out and progging at the grass so this was maybe the anchoring image for for that um, <coughs> another point about this collection is that um, Objects that are very familiar to us um, were actually quite remote from, from John Clare. And ironically enough, it was, it was paper. I mean, l literacy in general, right? And paper. So paper was terribly scarce, and Clare didn't have money to buy it. Sometimes his patron would give, give him some paper or just something that we just so take for granted was like crack cocaine for Claire. Um, there's a mythology about it that is sort of romantic. You know, he didn't have paper, so he wrote his poems on the brim of his hat or he wrote them on tree bark or something. But, but it was a huge problem. So paper becomes an object that is very, um, um, very, very loaded, and, it, and yet it's just something so ordinary um, for us. Um, and, you know, he would score some paper. It would be like, wow. Paper. It's a, you know, so I had fun with that. Um, I had fun with his progling stick. I had fun with the medical terms because when he was in the institution <coughs> for the last 20 years of his life, um, uh, you, you, you know, you might know some of this too, the medical history. You might encounter <coughs> a seton and cup. You might encounter the leech cure. You might encounter the rota rotating chair cure. And we don't really, we haven't experienced these, <laughs> but I think we know that um, we don't want them <laughs> used on us. Um, <laughs> so that's a little bit about that um, collection. Um, the 1950s novel, uh, I'm using um, clothing a lot, so I get to indulge my fetish with, uh, my fetish with clothing. Um, so maybe what, I'll, maybe what I'll do is just finish with reading I mean, you, I could read you a long catalog of airplane parts, but you might you might fall asleep. Um, it's funny I've studied uh, airplanes for seven years, uh, partly in, to attempt to overcome my my flying phobia. It didn't work. <laughs> I still don't know how. Oh, I don't know how that works. Um, but I had to find out enough to to be convincing. And uh, uh, readers are great. Readers will always tell you what you did wrong. They'll always, they're very happy to point out your mistakes. So after the World War II uh, aeronautical uh, aviation factory novel came out, I, I lo love it mostly, lo lovely reviews. Uh, one uh, retired Air Canada pilot emailed me and said that I'd, I'd done quite a good job of, of getting all the airplane stuff right. Like they, they go on a test flight and they had the, the pilots, the test pilots they had to put the plane into spins and go all kinds of crazy things. But I had gotten one little thing wrong with the test anyway. It was a kind, nice, I said, oh, thank you very much, and silly old me. <laughs> so um, readers are smart, you know, and, and they, uh, they, they do enjoy uh, telling you what you got wrong, but that's okay. Um, so I'm just gonna finish with one poem, I think, from um, uh, Bedlam Cowslip, the John Clare poems. John Clare in Love. 1818. He first saw her from afar, tramping across the field, a kind of moving statue, a girl heavy in good places. He scrambled up a pollarded tree to mark her shape and direction. He'd fallen from trees before. 
This time, despite the ale, he hung on. Even from a distance, he knew she'd look fine milking cows. Her sturdy form, those hands would draw the milk, would work the teats. High in the tree, he was more besotted than a bird and happier. His eyes followed her vanishing over the grassed horizon. He climbed to earth, penned two poems to her beauty. Anyone in love will recognize this, the heart's highest moment, this ledge of clock before the beloved's mouth opens and awry things go and go until the end of time. But there'd be buckets to fill with wildflowers, the green sward to harvest before that befell them, her name to discover. Could she love a lime burner? Like any decent girl, she'd send him away, but he'd return. Until then, in his choking shifts at the kiln, she'd cross that pasture in his mind a thousand times, and what he began to think was, she walked like someone who could read. So that's what uh, I do. Uh, I, I constantly embark on this, this, this quest to find that, that sweet spot, I guess, between um, distance um, and, and, and proximity. Um, so I thank you very much for, uh, for listening, and I'd be really happy to, yeah, sorry, I went over by six minutes. Darn it, I timed it too. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have or comments or things you want to share. Just thank you. And I'm really sorry there's no PowerPoint. Because those, um, those visual, those d um, designs from the, the soda companies um, from the 40s, beautiful. All that stuff. Lucky Strike cigarettes, gorgeous. So next time we'll have a proper PowerPoint of all those. Okay. Floor is now open for questions. Yes. politics yeah. and is there like a point for you or like mm -hmm. in your classroom perhaps yes. where the distance is just too far, yeah. <laughs> too much? Um, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd, I'd come at it from two different um, angles. Um, I would have thought, uh, okay this is one side of it, I would have thought yes, that there, there would be ways that a world that would be so remote that how would you ever mobilize a story around it but um, two um, authors um, both done extraordinarily well too um, uh, two novels that pop into mind right away um, one's called the golden mean and that's that's set in the classical era it's by Annabelle Lyon L Y O N and um, it's really extraordinary, and and an even more recent novel, *Neanderthal* by Claire Cameron, is set. How would you like? And it, they're both extreme. They're they're extremely successful novels. So how would you ever get inside that that world? Um, well, it's it's. Um, uh, Annabelle Lyne is a brilliant scene writer. First scene, if I remember, is. Uh, a woman on a, on a horse in this torrential rainstorm. Yep. So there's this dramatizing that that happens, and I confess I have not read Neanderthal yet. I've heard the author interviewed about it on the radio. She did an enormous amount of research. Um, I f I don't know how she pulled it off. Um, and the other side of it, I I I really appreciate your question. I do think that there are stories that are not mine to tell. Like you, you had mentioned uh, identity politics and there have been you know, many, many, many um, conversations around um, appropriation and, and things like that. So I, I don't know if I, that's, that I think that that's distance, 
uh, although I suppose one could frame it that way, um, cultural, I, I wouldn't presume, I just, I just would think, I would say to my students, I guess I would think really hard if that, is that your story to tell, you know, that might be another writer's story to tell. I don't know if that answers your <laughs> question. Yeah. Yes. Um, so this is by way of platform, and you come from a sort of an analog platform of, of paper writing, um, you know, e-readers or whatever. Um, but in one of the classes here this semester, um, we uh, we were tasked with looking at excavated objects from antiquity and um, producing. We were attending to to produce a website that will will draw a portrait of in part the excavation, some of the objects. So a very selected group, so 12 objects of total maybe, and write three or four different blurbs about them, 200 words. And for the most part, they were, you know, factual is found here, or it's used this way, it was constructed by this. Um, but then in part, you know, as, as an intended focus, but it just happened that we all would do what we ended up calling imagined voices blurbs. So the object often in use was how it, it turned out. But I wonder about the digital platform as a, both a, a, an opportunity for this kind of imagined voices, um, for, for writers to kind of just invent whole more worlds. But there's sort of a truthiness that we still you know, associate with the digital that it's supposed to be um, not fake news or not, it's supposed to be real. And so it's both a, a, an opportunity, I think, to imagine and to, to create, but at the same time, the digital aspect of it, in, in just a standalone website, do you think it's, it's implied that there's a certain amount of just the facts? You know, you, you, it's dangerous to go into too much imagination. Mm -hmm. And is, that, is there a place in the digital platform for historical fiction? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm not a, a digital um, scholar at all. I have colleagues in the uh, digital humanities. I guess my first immediate response is what, what is the website meant to be, I suppose. I mean, I, I think that would probably have a bearing on the, the content. I'm, I'm really, I'm really I'm sorry I've, to apologize. You're really out of my depth with things digital. But what? So tell me more though. What you you mean about like th there's a certain sense of um, a, a feeling of it's sort of almost illegitimate to make things yeah. up or. I, I mean, how mm -hmm. much? Is the, I know mm -hmm. that there is a, a market mm -hmm. on on the web for like fan fiction that develops yes. into something else. Um, but it does feel with websites in particular, especially if you're doing a website, that to kind of there doesn't just seem to be a lot of writers producing work exclusively on the web in, in that kind of digital format, in, right. in fiction. Uh, th there are um, <laughs> definitely um, a uh, number of very fine um, uh, digital magazines. Uh, yeah, I get what you're saying though, but probably more in poetry, uh, poetics, um, some fiction. Um, so the sense that the digital platform has its own, a kind of authority that, that shouldn't be violated or in a certain yeah. way, um, I, I guess so. I mean, I, I think I would ask where, where does that, that assumption come from and, and it, it must have to do with who creates the mm -hmm. platform and how they articulate what, what, what it is. Um, there's certainly digital um, magazines, online magazines that, that publish lots and lots of creative writing, but I still think you're, you have very interesting uh, train of thought because um, it shouldn't, I don't know, it's sort of self-indulgent to keep talking about my own thing, but uh, in an earlier draft, I actually thought I would use the, the, lady, the woman engineer's real name, mm -hmm. and I very, 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 very quickly abandoned that. I mean, she's a really well-known personage in, in history, and that would have been just a train wreck, right? So I think there's not kind of this, oh, we can do whatever I want, it's fiction. Uh, so you may be speaking a bit about that. Um, you know, so I changed her name, but I kept her, her disability. So um, she's, she's referenced in the acknowledgments, like who she really is. And I guess 
it wasn't felt that a disservice was done to her because I got invited to a event that celebrated the real person and that people were um, people thought it was cool that there were people were still so interested in her that that she would become a, a character in a in a novel but yeah I don't know quite exactly what to say other than that that world would have its own parameters I would I think I don't I don't know how you would navigate your way through that other than to be just be re really know what those parameters are Thank you. Uh, uh, Amanda had a question. I'm down at the end, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, so it, was really, it was really interesting to hear you talk to you, thinking about how much we actually have in common between creative writing and academic historical research. And, and I really want to hear a little more about your process. But you gave some discussions, but in terms of you know the the process of the research, writing, and revising, and it sounds like you don't go and say, okay, I'm going to go do my research and then write it up, it sounds like it's kind of an ongoing, and I'm, I was almost imagining as you were talking that you're, okay, you're writing your pa a paragraph about the scene in a diner, and then you pause for a year to go research <laughs> you know, yeah, the, yeah. the soda, you know, is, is it yeah. sort of like you're working through the process of the novel and you research as you go along, or, or how does yeah, it Yeah, thank work? you, Amanda, that's a great question, and um, <clears throat> I often have, I often suffer from imposter syndrome because, not speak for, cannot speak for all writers, but it's such a, um, an organic, fluky, fluke-driven, floundering kind of process for me, the research. But as I told Anna here in the library when I first arrived, she said, well, what, what are you looking for? And I said, well, I'm, I'm looking for something. <laughs> I said, actually, I'm looking for a subject to find me. So I did a, set out to write a book about John Clare. I was in a writing retreat in Scotland my mother just died, I was really sad, and I had writer's block, which I was really pissed about that because I don't believe in writer's block, but <laughs> apparently I had it. So I thought, if I can't write, at least I can read. So they had a lovely little library on the premises, never heard of John Clare, went out to the library and found this fabulous biography of John Clare by Jonathan Bate, and I just hooked immediately. So I, it sounds really flaky, but that subject found me. So <coughs> coming here, I've, I've been really open to things finding me and Anna's been just great about, hey, you might have, like have a look at this, have a look at this, have a look at this. So it's, it's difficult because if you're writing a grant as a scholar, which I have written many, <coughs> it's the opposite side of your brain. You have to be so specific and they want to know what your contribution to knowledge is. Oh Lord. Like, it's really I mean we have our we have our own um, granting agency just for creative but I, I also was actually trying to get a more scholarly grant because I wanted to hire some grad students so they don't have to live on Mr. Noodles. Um, and it's really difficult when you have a kind of intuitive uh, that sounds flaky too, but when your creative process is tr something will find you and you're just casting about and I, I thought I might look through some designs here and maybe I would I would get hooked and write ecrastic responses to them. So it's it's just something that's um, frustrating sometimes and, and it does lead to a lot of um, imposter syndrome because all these scholars are sitting around, they know exactly what they're doing and I'm just I'm just oh please something come to me. <laughs> so um, you have to be very patient, I guess. And um, I love reading scholarship. I, I learn so much, and I wouldn't have written this without um, scholarly work on Claire. It's a great resurgence of it these days. Went to a Claire conference in Oxford in 2014, and again they let artists come. They had another poet, and and it's wonderful when um, when when. Um, academic settings can be open to a kind of synergy with the creative arts and I learned that conference I just sat and wrote notes and listened to all the scholars papers on Claire. A scholar from Nebraska gave a paper on birds nests in his poems and how the poems were nested and embedded and structured. It was incredible so I wouldn't have finished this book without the work of scholars and same with uh, the other one. Um, so that's a, that's a bit of a ramble anyway. <laughs> Great question, thank you. Yes, young lady at the end. My question was actually the same question, but a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you talked a little bit about this, but 
curious about your experience working in various libraries, because libraries are different kinds of entities, and, and mm -hmm. our library happens to be digestible enough and browsable, mm -hmm. which is unusual for an academic mm -hmm. library or scholarly collection. And um, if there's anything in your time here that's been different about the way you've interacted with the collection or um, that's mm -hmm. had an impact on, on the work that you're doing. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I love your library. I, um, <coughs> and I didn't plant that question, so <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's, it's very unique and it's, it's a very interesting conceptually when, I think Laura, you were giving me the tour and you said, well, the, the whole concept was that the, the library would be all around you all the time and it kind of is and it's, it's really wonderful and it does, I think, open possibility for things to find you. Like I spent an afternoon with a, a, a beauty self-help beauty, me, women's medical beauty, in it's, in, it's in the, it's a behind the glass in yeah, the reading yeah, room. <coughs> yeah, I spent the afternoon with that, I made a whole bunch of notes, who knows, I might do some, there might be some poems that come out of that. Um, and uh, I, I'm kind of, I was thinking about the other day about those auction catalogs, and I do thought, what? Them? Pardon me? <laughs> well, I just didn't know they existed. I mean, there's so many things here that I, I, I just, I have no idea that... I that think you're just not a going away person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she has about 5,000 she wants yeah. to get rid of. Well, I'm kind of interested in them, and I, I, I'm just fascinated that someone actually, <sighs> like, archived all that, and I thought, I confess, I thought, why? <laughs> but there, there might be something there, you know? So, yeah, it's, there's all kinds of, you know, I mean, I hope to come back here and use the library at another point because my, my time here is re relatively um, short, but there's just a trove here of incredible stuff <laughs> for a creative writer, um, and I would have time to barely scratch the surface, but it's just this, this ex exploring and browsing and then you got to think, and what could you possibly do with auction catalogs? Maybe I can do a collage project with them, <laughs> you know. But but then you, it kind of goes back to what Amanda's saying. Focus is on my strong point, right? <laughs> I'd be, I would, no, no, you did it, you did it. But I would, I would have been a better scholar if I had, had a more focused kind of temperament. But I go off on this, and then I go off on this, and then I go off on this, and there's a joy in it. But there's also the other side of it, like what on earth am I doing? And then you have to just make a plan. So, but yes. Yes, and then, yes. Um, so I was really interested by what you said about how objects help you realize your story. Mm -hmm. um, and that struck me because I'm trained as, as a historical archeologist okay. and we write stories from objects basically. Um, right. And uh, we've become more and more cognizant of the fact that we really are engaged in a project that is somewhat fictional. Right, um, because there are only mm -hmm. certain uh, there's only a certain amount of things that we really can know about the past people who were engaged with the objects we write with. So, mm -hmm. but we're first given basically, or we first find through excavation, a set of objects that we have to work with and kind of construct a story about. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 so it seems to me that in some ways that that your process might be similar, that this that the objects find you, the story finds mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. But then in other instances you um, it, this the statement that objects help you realize your story uh, that you made might uh, seem to indicate that you have a story already mm -hmm. in your mind that you plan to tell and maybe you arrived at it through various means, but then when you find the lemon phosphate soda, it clicks that aha that is the soda. Yes. And I wonder mm -hmm. if um, <coughs> I guess what the, uh, my question, I guess, is um, how do you realize what your story is? And are there, like, and once you kind of figure that out, are there moments when the discovery of a new object redirects you? Mm -hmm. um, so that had you found a different soda, mm -hmm. might, might that have changed how you wrote the scene and how you imagined mm -hmm. the relationship between the characters? Yeah, what a great question, thank you. A different soda might have affected <laughs> how, I, how I wrote the scene. I'm trying to think of one of the other kinds I might have. Well, there were there were certain, like, wink and some of those old kinds of... But when I found lemon phosphate, I just I just knew. Um, sorry, can you? 
I, I guess it's how do you find your story? I mean, right, right, what's yes, the, right. What's oh, the role yeah. of objects yes. in? Yeah. Or is the story already something that pre-exists in your mind? Right. Well, oh my gosh, I <coughs> wish that the story was something that pre-existed in my mind. What, how do I find my story when? Really, really, really late. <laughs> really late. So the, the second novel coming out, The Small Things That End the World, it's due on December 1st, but that's what I do every morning four hour bouts, but I bought an extension from the publisher till the end of December, and, and I still don't totally know the story. Now, writers are all different, because it was, I don't know if it was John Irving, or some writers have the story, they do a out, proper outline, and they have the whole story in, on sticky notes. They know exactly what every scene is. And I so, so wish I was that kind of writer, but, but I'm not. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm just, I just grope and grope. So, I have to somehow have the faith that, and, and objects help me with that a lot. I would say this, that the, the novel I'm writing now, um, objects are really important, and, and um, what do you call it, kind of vernacular crafting is important. Part of it's in the 1970s. Remember, everybody's doing macrame, <coughs> right? That's kind of neat, the macrame is kind of back, I, I think, like sort of boho sort of style, interior design. I'm a junkie for that stuff too, right? But there's a lot of macrame in the novel, and there's a whole, it's tied to a whole sort of matrix of imagery having to do with connections between these women and, and, and ropes and lifelines and textiles and a lot of stuff like that. So what, what the objects do to help me push a story to completion, as far as I can tell, is once I sort of have something kind of hacked out that's not really done, but I use the objects like macrame, I say, okay, now I'm going to go in and I'm going to poeticize. Like these, every object is an opportunity. So with macrame, yeah, I had I had the character doing macrame and stuff. It's 1972, and Woodstock just happened and stuff like that. But now I thought, no, 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 no. That's a huge missed opportunity. You got to do way more with macrame. So now it's like everywhere, or it's 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 all threaded. So it's kind of like sewing in a way that the the objects allow me to build, I, I, I lean on them to help me build the story because I'm so bad at knowing the story mm -hmm. that once I can start poeticizing a little bit, like th this girl is sitting, you know, fretting about something, maybe, maybe she can be making macrame. So the objects allow me to pull these threads through and if I pull them and pull them and pull them, eventually, I'm not going to say I've found the perfect story, but I know that there's some sort of artistic cohesion, at least on the level of the images. If I could just jump in, I know I have Keith, but you'll forgive me for a second. Because what you just described in response to Meredith's question reminds me very much of the practice of Orhan Pamuk when he was writing The Innocence of Objects, uh, which is a novel about 1950s. It's not, well, I don't know if anybody's read it here, but he, um, he collected the objects first. And he had the idea of writing the novel as actually an exhibition catalog. Oh, wow. first. And then eventually he wrote it as a once upon a time, straightforward mm -hmm. narrative. Mm -hmm. And then after he wrote the novel, he opened the museum for the objects, the Museum of Innocence, oh, which is in business in Istanbul. But there he used precisely this conceit of acquiring the objects as a way of then building the plot. That's fascinating. I've written, I'm going to check that out. And I, I've, I've sort of done a very, very basic and cohate level of that. I think I do that. Like I dressed in 1940s, I collected 1940s stuff and I listened to big band and you know for eight years and now I'm you know collecting. <laughs> yeah I know that's a lot Dark of dedication. That's a lot of Artie Shaw and Glenn Miller but hey it, it, it got me, it, it, would, it would get the scenes going. So I in some, I think that's really fascinating and I'm, I thank you. I'm going to check that book out and it's just, it's just some kind of pulling these threads and pulling and pulling and the objects are going to help. You just have to have that faith that they will. It's hard, but <laughs> yes. Um, thank you. So it's very interesting. Um, and we've been talking a lot about um, stories and writing generally. And I'm wondering if there, about the difference or even the distance between poetry and prose mm -hmm. and how you might, a story might develop as a poem and one that might develop as a, as a novel. Your writing on John Clare put me in mind of Adam Folds' book, The Quickening Maze. And Adam Folds, like you, is a poet who then wrote um, a novelized version of, um, of John Clare's life. 
focusing. Oh, yes, I do. Yes, yeah, I love it. Yes. It's a really interesting book. Um, and but kind of, it's not a conventional novel. It's more of a sort of prose poem. Yes, I, I know of it. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if you have a different sort of approach to poetry and prose, or how how a story materializes as yeah. a poem versus. Thank you. That that's a great question, and I actually even know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, there is this point where poetry and prose meet. And it's called The Dark Night of the Soul. I'm <laughs> out of my mind, stuck on this project, and I don't know how to write this. Like, this almost didn't get published, because I wrote a draft, and the publisher just <coughs> hated it. Hated it. And I, I hated it, too. And so I, I, I went to a writing retreat, I sat at a desk, and this is answering your question. Honest to gosh, I was so depressed. I thought, you know what? Just write it as a poem. Forget about the novel. It's not going to get published anyway. Just so I started to write it as a dramatic monologue in the one character's voice, but essentially was felt like writing a poem. So it's the girl's real quirky little kind of girl, and, and she. I just I heard a riff. So when you write poems, it comes more, probably less from an object, and more from um, an, a, a riff really, something you just can't get out of your head. So. It's, she, it's her voice. She goes, I know where the moon lives now. In the east end of the sky, or something, where the sky meets the future, something. It, it's, I know where the moon lives now. I thought, well, that's fine for a poem. I know where the moon lives now. But, but, then, but you know what? Then I just let it all go. I thought, it's not going to get published anyway. Just, just, you're at this writing tree. Just write <coughs> poetry. And that got her voice. And same with this novel. When, whenever I'm stuck, my default mode is poetry. So there's a kind of like, it's a way that it's a life, what is it, like a lifeline, right? So I, I don't think, I'm not very good at thinking in terms of story, to be honest, or narrative. I think in terms of um, riffs or <coughs> objects or images. So the moment where poetry and um, prose cross is this moment where, almost like letting go of genre, so write what you hear, and somehow this girl's voice came to me. And and my poetry is very narrative. It's that's a good thing, unless I I like you know I like narrative poetry. I like poets who are can be both lyric and narrative and have that force. So it's when you have no idea what to do, and in your heart you just default back to your the motherland of of, of a riff or a word or. So it, it does kick in, it helps you. <laughs> I don't know if it's the muse or what, but it helps you. Thank you, really, really great questions. So I think we're at regulation time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> talk. Um, feel free to linger, eat, and ask questions, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, and thank you very, very much. You're welcome.